mean, everyone's piece is really different, but there's certain elements that kind of, you know, just echo other people's pieces. So it's really nice to bring it all together. And I think we've all got some other ideas about when we go to different sites. What's interesting about putting this up for the first time is hearing the composition really between all of those pieces coming together and it's actually working really well. There's, there's areas you can stand and all, a lot of the sounds complement each other. It's been really nice to see it on the beach. It's a beautiful setting for it um, and it's very expansive and reflective. My installation is a piece called Arpeggi, and it's two. It's, it's modelled on a, an anemometer, you know, the kind of thing that you use to measure wind speed. And you, you normally see them when they're about this big. They're sort of a few, um, few centimetres across. And I kind of figured it'd be quite nice to, to make one of those, but just increase the size essentially. And and that also gives you the opportunity to put a speaker into each of the the, the hemispheres of the anemometer which will sort of throw the sound out in turn as, as the thing turns around. So, so what I've basically made is um, two large anemometers which kind of counter-rotate. Each one rotates in opposite direction. And they have speakers um, inside the, pointing into the domes, so that as they rotate, they throw the, the, the sound out at you. Um, and you hear each one in turn, and, and hence the, the name, because it's essentially creating an arpeggio as it goes round. So, and there were two of them, so arpeggio. People immediately make this kind of connection with sci-fi, aliens, you know, um, radar, um, old kind of 50s technology, aluminium domes and beeps and buzzes and things like that. And uh, that's been the overriding thing, is, the, is this, this kind of feeling of, of, of some, some kind of old, old sort of 1950s style technology or even sort of something alien or futuristic. As I sort of spend quite a bit of time watching birds and I've kind of been spent a lot of time around reed beds and so I, start, I was filming the reeds and observing how, well of course they have to move to sort of spread their seeds and they can move very, even, even in a very gentle breeze the reeds will still move a little bit. And even in a really strong breeze, they will move but not fall over and buckle. So I was thinking, oh, I really want to try and make some reeds and be inspired by this uh, natural phenomenon of moving. So once you've got some kind of movement, of course, you can then use that movement to, to make some sound or to resonate objects. So I started off experimenting with different lengths and different thicknesses of steel um, held in kind of bases and just experimented with different sorts of tops, really. Um, and so... I started off with little sails, with kind of bells or stones, like part way down the reed, and then I started experimenting with stones on tops of the, the metal. And so, yeah, just lots and lots of playing around with different weights and heights and lengths in different types of wind. And so what I've come up with um, are these this set of pieces, some of which use pebbles, which I was really excited about because of being, being a pebbly beach, especially in Brighton. So it's kind of this sort of floating surface of pebbles that all sort of gently tap together. And you can, um, the invitation is for the audience, or the, you know, the viewer to kind of listen closely to the pebbles and they kind of do this nice tapping together. And then the other pieces are using different sort of metal hemispheres, the brass hemispheres that um, all make slightly different kind of bell-like sounds. My whole thing is to kind of create work that is a combination of the sort of visual and sonic elements. So, you know, I want the visual and the sound to be of equal importance in the piece. Um, so, I mean, I think the work that I've previously done has probably been a bit more slanting towards the, the visual element, but so it's, it's great to sort of have this focus on the sound and to really, like, um, use that as the, the original, you know, the sort of starting point impetus for the piece. The installation is called um, the Eolian Harp because it's, it's basically strings, stretch strings, which is the basic um, uh, component, the element of all the Aeolian harps is, is string based and uh, I've created uh, uh, an installation which uses um, 
The strings are held in tension by curved material, curved um, shapes, and um, you get the Aeolian tone, which means that harmonics are all, um, you know, you get the fundamental note, and then you get the half harmonic, and then the quarter, and then so on and so on. Different strengths of, strengths of wind going across these, these um, strings create different forms of harmonics, and then they combine together into, into a sound. The thing I love most about working with um, sound is the unpredictability of working outdoors, of course. You know, because you're working with something which is not fixed. It can shift at any time. Minute by minute, this wind is changing. You know, you, get, uh, you might get the same conditions for 10 minutes, and then you get the same conditions for two or three hours. It relates, really, why I like it so much is because I'm an improviser, a music improviser, and when you're working with improvisers, it's a little bit like weather inside, because you don't know what the other improviser is going to do. There's no score, there's no um, predictability about that, which is what I like about it. It's a, it's a, when you're improvising with another musician, it's a journey into, into the unknown, which is similar to being outside with these kind of installations. My installation is called Howling Wire. It's uh, based around an ex-military pneumatic pump-up telescopic mast. It goes up 12 metres and it's in within a 12 meter circle. Uh, from the top of that mast are strings and straps which come down and they vibrate in the wind at different frequencies. Some create a low frequency, some take a high frequency, and then they're attached to various drums which amplify the sound, two of which are ex-orchestral timpani drums, the copper kettle drums. They're on stands and they make a sort of choral sound which is kind of high pitched and varies and it's quite ethereal. And then two of them are bass drums and that's a low frequency drone sound. Sounds a bit like a didgeridoo um, and there are two of them so they can be tuned so you get a, an oscillation between two of them. The sort of the frequency creates a beat. Um, so that they're essentially the basis of it and then around the edge of it are what I'm calling anemomophones, which are three cups which um, spin round and they spin flutes and then I've got various other straps and little flutes which are on wind vanes so the, the vane points them into the wind which keeps the, the flute like the end of a recorder or something like that to create a whistle sound and then using several of those it builds up a chord. Generally, people seem to seem to love it. Um, that you know, some people do ask if it's electronic, or and then when you point out that it's a piece of pallet strap vibrating, they're like, "Wow, right, okay," and and that they they seem to warm to like they like this. Well, actually, mixed your reactions to the sounds. Some people the bass sounds. Some people really love it, and they kind of put their head in the bass drum, and it's like a didgeridoo, and they they find it quite. Um, an earthy sound and like it and then somebody said yesterday it sound one of the sounds they heard it from a distance and they were quite spooked by it and they found it quite scary um, some another guy said he sounded it sounded like a hundred women screaming in the distance um, and uh, which I, I was a bit oh, okay but he seemed to think that was a good thing um, with stress and stone it's been uh Working with uh, wind harmonics and stretched wires uh, is something I've been um, interested in for quite a while. And the particular aspect of this that I like is the tension that's caused with the bowed um, rods and the stone, which kind of pulls down towards earth, whereas the rods are kind of arcing up towards the sky. Um, the two different aspects of that create the tension, which is the actual tuning and the creates the pitch that the harmonics of the wind are picked up. Uh, particularly great on Brighton Beach because of course um, we've got this sort of fishing thing going on there and I like I, I just like the tension and, and, and movement and, and curves in that piece. Yesterday when I was setting up the stressed stone piece you know it was sounding absolutely beautiful and um, it's a case of more is less you know we've got more wind today but you've actually got less dynamics in the wind so the, the, the strength of the wind and is not related to the quality of the experience. You, just because you've got more power there, you've actually got less dynamic because it's, everything's just running on full throttle. And a lot of the um, installations that we've created, we haven't, you know, not not having a kind of coastal beach location to test these things. We haven't had, you, you know, you don't get a full four six in your studio uh, running for. 12 hours a day to kind of put things through their paces so 
and uh, we were actually more worried about the lack of wind on this gig than what we've actually ended up with today which is so yeah I think every situation is going to be um, a learning curve and there probably isn't going to be a curve it's <laughs> more like a jagged random line I think <laughs> I suppose I started off uh, this whole project um, looking at how the wind behaves, the dynamics of wind, and how and listening to the wind in trees, in reeds, or whatever that happened, in the, uh, blowing through the house, etc. And what I wanted to do was create an installation that was both visual and sound, and that the visual element created uh, a visual dynamic for the wind, so that. Um, as the wind gusted, you would see the changes in it. And so that's the reason I went for something that uses multiples. There's 21 at the moment of the, uh, in the phantom field. And these are small... Um, they're like a wind turbine. They're little fans from computers, actually, that are um, being directed into the wind with a sail. Um, then, so that as the wind changes in direction, you immediately see that as a visual thing. The, re the reaction from the, the people that were, have been around today and yesterday when we were testing out has been really good. People want to actually wander through the field because there's one, there's one part where you, where you stand on the edge and you hear one continuous sort of uh, soundscape, but as you walk through them, because they're all tuned slightly differently, they're all reacting to the wind slightly differently, you've got a continually changing soundscape as you walk through it, and as you walk past one, then you hear that much louder, and so you've got, you know, you've got very, um, a number of different smaller soundscapes within the larger. We're basically using uh, an instrument which is uh, traditional in both China and Indonesia, uh, the, the small flutes which sit on the tail feathers of pigeons and so as they fly through the air um, notes are produced and it creates a, a beautiful sound. Well I was first approached by Nathan and you know, I actually got a phone call you know asking whether you know whether I'd be interested in this project and everything so and, and basically I was more than interested but I was a little bit curious so I wasn't sure whether it was a a little bit of a wind-up maybe or something because it was a strange request for someone to phone up and say can you fly some pigeons with whistles on the tails the response so far has been unbelievable you know the interest and genuine interest as well and curiosity I mean so that well they just can't wait can they yes. they can't wait for us to lure them out like yeah Come on. Come on. Come on. 